I assume you know how to share and stuff since you've done yeah. it before. Yeah, right now. Oh, I want this view. Which view are you seeing? Are you seeing the... I'm seeing the presenter's view. Okay, I don't want that. No. Let's do this one. Now what do you see? The right way. Perfect. Good. We have one more minute and then we'll get started. If you would like to um, type in the chat box where you are located, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Make sure I've saved it so everybody can chat. Illinois. Anybody else want to let us know? Arkansas, Georgia, California, North Carolina. Wow. Quite a few so far. It's just can't adjust the states. Kansas. Nobody from Nebraska except for our speaker. <laughs> Colorado. Wow. Okay. Well, it's three o'clock, so I'm going to get us started. Uh, my name's Jacqueline Jacob, and I am the uh, poultry extension project manager here at the University of Kentucky. As part of my job, I um, coordinate our monthly uh, webinars on for small and backyard flocks. Uh, it's usually the first Tuesday of each month. And so it is our first Tuesday of, uh, what are we in, March, <laughs> that uh, we are having on chicken breeds, varieties, and strains. Next month, we are going to be talking about the life of a chicken owner. So uh, if you're thinking about getting into it, you can see uh, what the life is like. Um, right, and so I will be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A box. So if at any time you think of a question that you would like answered, um, type it in either one. Uh, if the question is specific to what the speaker is talking about, I will turn on my monitor and um, microphone and pop up and ask him for the clarification. Otherwise, the uh, question will wait to the end. If you're like me and you, you don't write it down as soon as you think about it, you forget it. So, you know, whenever you have a question, feel free to write it down. So today's speaker is um, Brett Kreffels from uh, Nebraska. He is an extension educator there, um, and he will be talking about understanding the chickens, breeds, varieties, and strains. So all yours. Perfect. Thank you, Jackie. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, well, welcome you guys to my presentation. So uh, like Jackie said, my name is Brett Rifles. I am from Nebraska. I am uh, the 4-H Extension Educator in Douglas and Sarpy County. So um, the Omaha area. Um, that's one hat that I wear. The other hat that I wear is I am one of the Extension Educators in the state. Actually, I think the only Extension Educator in Nebraska that deals with ex exclusively the backyard flocks as well as the exhibition flocks. Um, I work in concert with our state specialist um, to kind of get a lot of information out there about poultry, poultry breeds, poultry husbandry, hatching, everything else to the masses. That's not the commercial box. So um, I guess I wear another hat too. So I wear three hats. The other, the third hat that I wear is a personal hat. It's, I actually show and breed poultry. So I show a number of chicken breeds and um, waterfowl breeds that I show all over the Midwest as well as parts of the South. So I'm a professional showman. And my little caveat to this whole presentation is um, I know we're going to try to figure out how do we understand and identify chicken breeds, varieties, and strains, but uh, my presentation can only go so far because there are hundreds of different chicken breeds out there. And there's just as many colors and varieties and patterns and all that kind of stuff. So I can only give you the basic bare tools to identify 
some of these breeds and varieties. So my my encouragement to you is um, attend a show, talk to breeders, um, and go learn for yourself, right? So it took me years and years and years and years to learn all of these different things, these different varieties. So you're not going to learn it all here today, but you're going to get some of the tools to help you better understand how do we identify these chicken breeds and varieties. And I'm, I focus solely on chicken breeds, and we could go into waterfowl, um, which would be a little easier just because there's not as many, but today I'm just going to focus on the chicken breeds. So let's get started here. I'm hoping there's not a delay in, there it goes. Okay, so things to consider uh, when you're trying to identify a chicken breed or a strain, okay? So a lot of these breeds have certain body conformations. They look a certain way. Some are flat, some are round, some are tall, some are short. Um, so we're gonna dive into that a little bit. Uh, we're gonna look at the color, not only in the feathers, but the, um, the legs have a different color, the eyes, a lot of these different colors that are involved with these different breeds and strains. Um, one of the more easier ways to identify certain breeds of chickens is by their combs. So there's many different comb types. And for those of you who are not, are not aware, that is the fleshy thing on top of their head. Uh, so we'll look at that real quick. And then some other anatomical features. So there's some pretty weird looking chicken breeds out there and all of them have something kind of cool um, that it kind of associates them with their, their certain breed breed characteristics. So we'll look at a few of those. And then quickly, we'll talk about exhibition versus production. Um, a lot of times those two things can be one and the same, but when we're talking about specific breeds of chickens, especially for exhibition, the productiveness kind of drops off and the, the, um, oh, the prettiness of the chicken kind of rises to the top. But we'll talk about that. And then bantam versus large fowl, the big ones and the small ones. And again, I'll just make this, reiterate this, it takes years of experience. So please go to a show in your area and check out all the different breeds. I, I, if you've never been to a poultry show before, a big poultry show, um, you, I almost guarantee you, you walk in that door and your jaw will drop at how many birds are in that building as well as how many different varieties and breeds. So I know, I think we had a couple from California and I think Illinois, um, there's some good shows out there. Check them out. Um, here's a couple of resources for you. So this is the newest version of the American Standard of Perfection for Poultry. I have yet to get the newest one. I got the older one. But the good thing is not many times do they change a whole lot. So if you're wanting to learn more about poultry breeds and colors and how to actually, how judges judge poultry, this is the book you need. Um, it's not too pricey. I think it's the newest one, I think like 75 bucks. So good Christmas gift, birthday gift, nice coffee table book. Um, I, I will admit that I call this my chicken Bible and I do look at this a lot more than I do the actual one. Um, but again, it has all the breeds. Uh, go ahead and talk to breeders and judges. Judges and breeders love to kind of talk, talk through birds, talk about different classes, talk about different breeds and colors. Um, I know some some animal species, uh, the breeders don't like to give a whole lot of information out, but I noticed um, with poultry breeders, we just give information freely. You ask the question and we're going to answer it. So uh, please reach out to those individuals. If you're not quite sure where breeders are in your state or judges, um, you can go to the American Poultry Association or the American Bantam Association website and you can find some resources there too. Um, Another good way to kind of figure out what breeds are is go ahead and grab as many hatchery catalogs as you can. Um, this is the time of year where baby chicks are starting to show up at farm supply stores. Um, baby chickens are heading out through the mail from the hatchery. So some of these hatcheries have really uh, nice descriptive um, catalogs. Go ahead and just get online and grab a few of those. I know I, I don't buy chicks anymore, um, since I hatch my own, but I still get a few of these in the mail and I do enjoy looking at these uh, every time I get them. So easy way to look up some of the more common breeds of chickens is through hatchery catalogs. All right, so we're gonna look at some breed ID features. Um, and again, you can just look at these pictures here that, I, that I've got here. Many different breeds, many different body styles, many different colors. So this is where it gets a little interesting and how do we decipher 
what is a quotient? What is a Rhode Island red? What is a and a seal? Okay, or a Polish. So we're going to dive into that real quick, and hopefully this helps you out. So a couple things to look for. So all chickens, whether they're judged or not, um, have a body structure and conformation that should match their breed. Okay. Um, like I said a little earlier, so we have fat breeds, we have skinny breeds, we have tall breeds, we have short breeds, we have long back, short back, they're all over the place. So I've kind of narrowed this down to three things you need to look for in terms of body conformation if you're trying to look at the different varieties and strains of breeds. So some breeds like this uh, Plymouth Rock here, this barred Plymouth Rock, are very deep body. Okay? And what I mean by deep body is that depth from basically the middle of the back all the way down to where that hock starts, so that start of the foot. Okay? Some breeds, like the Leghorn we'll watch or look at here in a little bit, um, they're a little narrow body. They're not as deep as a, a Plymouth Rock. And so this really comes in handy when you've got, we'll say, a white Plymouth Rock. White Plymouth Rocks look kind of like Leghorns, right? Yellow legs, white, um, white feathers, but the body depth is going to give it away. Okay. Uh, length of back. So again, we'll use the Plymouth Rock um, analogy here. So Plymouth Rocks need to have a fairly long back. They should not be short coupled. Uh, whereas a Leghorn is also a long back. Okay. So we have two long back breeds, long flat back breeds. So then we go back to the depth. Is it wide? Is it deep? And then another thing is tail angle. So tail angles are all over the place on chickens. We have some tail angles like the Plymouth Rock or, or even the Rhode Island Red, which are nearly flat, nearly horizontal. Um, I believe the angle they describe is like 20 degrees, which isn't a whole lot. Whereas some breeds like the Langshan, like the ones that I raise at home, their tail angles are about 70, 75 degrees. And you think 90 degrees is straight up and down. So the tail angle is slightly off of 90 degrees. So tail angle, back length, and body depth are three ways that we can help identify some of these breeds, varieties, and strains. And I mentioned the American Standard Perfection for Poultry. All of this is in here. All of that, what the proper length is, what the proper tail angle is in depth, it's all in there. So look at that. Okay. But let's compare real quick while we had the slide up. The exhibition versus production differences. So I mentioned leghorns, for instance, have a very long back. The production strains do not. Okay, so leghorn production birds have a very short back. So then we need to look at a couple other characteristics. Do they have that shallow body? Okay, yeah, they do, right? Okay, do they have a single comb? Yes, they do. Is the tail angle about 40, 45 degrees? Yes, it is. So with those things in mind, even the production and the exhibition strains share some commonalities between the tail angle and um, the body depth. So they may look different a little bit, but if we use these same criteria, uh, we can determine that the production leghorn that we see all the time is still considered a leghorn, but just doesn't have the refinedness of an exhibition leghorn, if that makes sense. So we've got the body confirmation. Now let's look at the comb types. So I bet most of you are familiar with probably, I would say probably the most common comb type, which is a single comb. This is the quintessential comb that we see in all of cartoons, all movies with chickens. It, it just screams chicken, right? So letter A there is a single, and this is characterized by uh, the chicken having the base, which is against the head. They have the points, which are the things that stick up above the head. And then they also have the blade, which is the part that juts out the back. So examples of chickens that are going to have single combs are your leghorns, your Plymouth Rocks, your Rhode Island Reds, um, 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 New Hampshire's. They all have single combs. Uh now, and then we get into uh, a pea comb. A pea comb is a, a more, uh, less common comb. Uh, we see, see these in the Brahmas and the Cornish. So if you ever watch that video, a good, a good example of what a Brahma looks like. If you ever watch that video of that massive chicken coming out of a small nest box, that's a Brahma. Big, big birds. But they have pea combs. 
Strawberry is uh, letter C. We don't see many strawberry combs very often. I Very rarely do I see one. Uh, we'll go to cushion D. Cushion combs um, are usually seen in Chanticleers, which is a, a Canadian breed. Walnut combs, which we see all the time in silkies. I know everyone's got to have a few silkies in their farm. Um, but that's an example of a chicken that's got a walnut comb. And no one can mistake the buttercup comb. The only chicken that can have a buttercup comb is the buttercup. And I can characterize this as having basically two um, single combs kind of put together on the same head, but they're separated a little bit by a little bit of distance. Okay. V-shaped, V-shaped combs, uh, La Flesh have those. That's a continental breed, as well as our common um, Polish have V-shaped combs. And then the probably the other most common comb that we see a lot is the rose comb. Most um, flocks, backyard flocks, at least have one or two wine dots um, in their flock at every, any one time or had them in the past. So those are another breed that has a rose comb breed. Okay. Um, here's where it gets tricky with the combs. Okay. We can have some breeds are seen with a single comb and a rose comb. And a good example, examples of these are Rhode Island Reds and Lake Forms. And so here's two pictures here I pulled off the internet. Um, we have two light brown lake horns, two varieties. We have a single comb and a rose comb. Okay. So if we go back and we try to use our, our depth, length, tail angle, okay, and you can just see from these pictures here that both of these breeds here, both of these varieties, both of these um, single comb and rose comb varieties of brown lake horn have a long back. They're very uh, shallow in their body, and they have the same angle tail, which is about a 40, 40, 40 to 45 degrees. So just based on that criteria alone, we know that they're leg horns. Okay? We look at the comb, we know one's a single and one's a rose. Okay? Both the same breeds, same color too, just a different comb variety. The good thing about this is in all my years of showing poultry and judging poultry, we don't see too many rose comb, single rose comb and single comb lake horns or rural and reds in the same show. The exception is the Iowa State Fair. We always see some of the same at the Iowa State Fair. Okay. But this is where it gets just a little tricky. All right, let's move on to some unique anatomical features because a lot of these features here can give a breed or a variety away really quick. So first of all, we have an anatomical feature, the crest. So right now, if we look at the crest, we can eliminate a whole bunch of breeds off our list. The ones we can't eliminate are gonna be the Polish and the Houdans and the Crevacores. Those are three breeds with crests. Um, at, I will say we'll put the silkies in there too. They also have a crest, but um, so these crested breeds, you have to do a little more deducing of body type and stuff, but you can eliminate a whole bunch of breeds just by saying, yep, this bird has a crest. It's got feathers all over its head. And the next one kind of goes with the crest. We have, this here is an Americana, another breed with a pea comb, but we know it's an Americana because it has a beard and muffs. So beard is the, the feathers underneath the, the beak, and the muff is the, the feathers kind of on the side of the beak. So if we go back to the, the crested one, you can also see another example of a bird that's got a beard and a crest. I'm sorry, a beard and, and muffs too. Some people get these, these two birds mixed up. I hear them both ways. So the next one is called an aeracana. An Aracana. So we have Americana in the middle, has a beard and muff. We have an Aracana on the far right, and it has tufts. So if you notice, the tufts are not attached to the, the beak or anywhere close to the beak. It does not have a beard. And what I should have done is I should have showed you a picture of the actual bird because Aracanas do not have a tail. They are what we call rumpless. So right then and there, if you see a chicken that's got tufts, doesn't have a tail, you automatically know it's an Aracana and not Americana. 
But I see those birds interchange, those breeds interchanged all the time. And actually both of them lay multicolored eggs, either brown or not brown, a green, pink, we'll say, and blue. All right, so here's some other features. We've all seen chickens with feathered feet. Okay. Some like them, some hate them. <laughs> but um, when you find a chicken with feathered feet, again, in your mind, if you're looking at trying to figure out what breed it is, you can eliminate a whole bunch of breeds and varieties based on foot feathering alone. I would say most chickens do not have feathered feet, only a few do, especially those in some of the Bantam classes and the, and the uh, uh, Asiatic classes, the large bird classes. So this here is called a Brahma. And other birds that have, other breeds that have feathered feet are going to be your Koshans, which are very recognizable. And we'll see an example here in a little bit. Um, as well as Langshans, uh, uh, Belgian bearded Yuckles, and um, Silkies. Okay, so just those few breeds alone, okay, you can eliminate a whole bunch other than that. Here's one that kind of gives it away too. This next one is a middle picture. This is a uh, a sultan. Okay, so let's use our our features here. So we've got a crest. Okay, we've got a beard and muff. Uh, we've got a V-shaped comb. But this time we have some feathered feet, but they look a little different than that Brahma next to it. These guys have vulture hawks. So only three breeds can have vulture hawks. One of them is a sultan. The other one is a Belgian bearded yuckle. We see a lot of uh, the millefleur color. So when I say Belgian bearded yuckle, uh, millefleur is what I hear the most often. Um, and then Buddhas. So here's an anatomical feature where you can eliminate all the breeds except for three. Okay. And I'll tell you the Buddhas do not have a beard and muff. They also don't have a V-shaped comb. And the Belgian bearded yuckles or the millefleurs have a have a, a beard, a muff, a single comb, but they also have vulture hawks. So vulture hawks are pretty easy to distinguish. In any other breed, it's a disqualification other than those three. And no one can forget one of my favorite all-time breeds. I, I raised the Bantam form of these. These are naked necks. So this is probably the easiest breed to, to recognize, the easiest strain to recognize is the naked neck, also known as a turkin because they kind of look like turkeys, kind of look like chickens. So they're kind of a cross between the two, but they are all chicken. So if you see a naked neck chicken, you know automatically it's a, it's a naked neck. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about chicken colors. So for those of us that have raised chickens for many, many, many years, we know through going to shows or just seeing all kinds of chickens that they come in every color on, under the sun. Okay. Um, I will tell you personally, from my experiences in judging chickens and breeding chickens and going to shows, for new people, this is the hardest thing to grasp because there's so many patterns, so many colors. So this is one thing that really takes you a long time to kind of get to know and understand. But we're going to dive into a few of these colors here, kind of the more common colors and um, patterns and varieties. Okay. And here's the other issue, too. Within the breeds within the varieties and strains, there could be multiple color patterns. So again, you need to figure out comb type, body type, tail angle, then go and look at the colors to determine what breed and color that is. I know in one breed, I believe the um, old English game banners, there's like 30 different colors. So that's the, that's the breed that takes me the most time to kind of figure out what color is this. And they're always coming out with new ones. So I'm going to go through some of the common colors you see, as well as some of the some of the common color patterns you're going to see. Um, everyone's familiar with the Buff Orpington, and they call them the Buff Orpington because that's the colors, buff. Um, it's a nice, rich, golden color all the way throughout the bird. Uh, and I will say, I'm just going to put the caveat here, all the breeds that I'm going to talk about in the color section all have different colors associated with them. So if you see these colors here, just know that these aren't the only colors this breed has. So the buff, you can see those in white, black, or blue. Uh, sorry, the Orpington, you can see them buff, black, white, or blue. I think that's what I meant. Okay. Um, up top, 
in the middle there is called a splash. This is a combination of the blue gene. So when you breed the little genetics lesson, so if you breed the, the blues together, two blues together, the result is you're going to have 50% of those chicks are going to come out blue, 25% will come out black, and 25 will come out splash. So it's this combination of that blue and white, blue, black color. Um, really good for making good blues. Uh, next on the right underneath that's the black. So to me, white and black are probably the most common colors you're going to see. Uh, most breeds come in white or black. Some do, some don't. Um, let's go down to the bottom left. That is the blue color. So if this is a cushion. This is a blue cushion. Um, cool thing about the blue is because there's black in there in the genetics, you should get a blue feather with a black outline. We call that a lace, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, let's jump over to the red. So this is a Rhode Island red. Again, a breed that's got a very flat back, very deep-bodied bird, but the red color gives it away. So Rhode Island reds come in both red and white. So we call those the Rhode Island whites. And then up top, this chicken, even though it's the same color, goes by two different names depending on the breed. So for all breeds, except for one, this color is known as the Colombian color. Um, I will say from color pattern standpoint, I'm not a color pattern guy. I'm a black and white kind of guy. But this is probably my favorite color pattern out of all of them. Um, it's, they're well laced. What I mean, I'll show you in a second what I mean by lace. But the contrast of black and white is really striking in a really good Colombian. So all breeds, it's called the Colombian color, except... The Brahma. Um, this same color pattern is called light. So in the Brahmas, they come in light, dark, and buff. So if you see a light Brahma, that's what it looks like, that color pattern. If you see a Colombian Brahma, just know it's supposed to be light. So here's some of our pattern birds. And I'm sorry, some of these descriptions didn't come out very well. Um, the one on the top is the top left for me. This is called a double laced. Um, ah, let's, let's do this first. Let's go down to the bottom. Let's go to lace so you can understand what double laced means. So to be a laced color pattern, you need to have um, typically a white surface color with another color outlined, or it could be the blue, or it could be some base color. And it's outlined with some other color. So in this case, this is a silver laced wine dot bantam. So you can note you note that the, the feather essentially is white with a black outline. So jump up to that double lace. Now we've got basically two laces, two lace patterns on one feather. So in this case, uh, it's, uh, this is a um oh, I just I just lost it. Um Oh my gosh, the breed just left me. Anyway, this is the lace pattern. So it's got a surface color with two black laces, barn velvet, there it is, two laced patterns in one feather. We only see this in the barn velvets, by the way. Up top in the middle is called the partridge. So this is kind of like a lace pattern, but the, the, the pattern isn't as intricate as a laced would be. Okay. We see a lot of this uh, partridges in the wine dots. We see them in chanticleers. We see them in a lot of different breeds. Um, the only difference is, like in silkies, for instance, the partridge looks a little bit different. We don't have this intricate pattern with the silkies because of their silky appearance. Next, we have a pencil, which is a more intricate, um, I'll say kind of a jagged, not a jagged, a pointy, there we go, a pointy laced pattern. So each feather kind of comes to a point in terms of that the dark outline and then we can't uh we can't miss the barred pattern so this is the easiest one to to note because of its distinct barring pattern from the skin all the way up to the end of the feather so when we say barred first breed that comes to mind is the barred plymouth rock so if you see a barred pattern it's almost always a barred plymouth rock especially if you've got that again deep body long back uh, uh, single comb, tail angle, in this case, yellow legs. Like I said earlier, by far the hardest part of knowing the breeds and strains is the color. 
aspect of it. All right, let's do some lookalikes here. So we have two breeds um, that visually look different, but the color, for instance, is kind of the same. So let's do some distinguishing factors between these two breeds here. Okay? So the first one there, uh, we notice that it's extremely deep bodied from that from the middle of the back all the way down to the start of the hock or the foot. It's really long in its body, from the shoulder all the way up to the tail and back. And the tail angle is fairly level, as opposed to the next one. Oh, and I forgot to mention, it's got a single comb. Okay, it's got those, at those points and the blade in the back. This one here, a lot shallower body really short back, tail angle is really elevated, and the barring pattern is just a little bit different. To me, this bird doesn't have that distinct pattern, okay? And it's also got a rose comb, okay? So let me put these all together. Short tail angle, long back, single comb, flat body profile, deep body, intricate barring, um, very angular, uh, body style short back high tail rose comb so the breed on the left instead of all all presentation this is a plymouth rock the barred plymouth rock male the one next to it is a dominique male and if you can't think of anything else you see a barred bird okay you try to you can't remember exactly how to distinguish them always remember this between the dominiques and plymouth rocks Plymouth Rock has a single comb. Dominique always has a rose comb. Okay. When I go to county fairs, I will see a lot of these Dominiques that are labeled Plymouth Rocks because people just associate barring with the barred Plymouth Rock, but that's not the case. They're, they're Dominiques because of the rose comb. All right, let's talk quick about Bantams versus large fowl. So most of you probably have some large fowl in your flocks or will have some large fowl. And some of you might have bantams. I know in my flock, I have both. I have large fowl and bantams in my flock. But bantams are just miniature versions of the large fowl. Okay. Typically, they're about one third to one half the size. And I would even go as far to say as about a quarter of the size, depending on the breed um, of their larger counterparts. But we also have true bantams. And what that means is they do not have a bigger version of themselves. So we have two cushions here. One's a large fowl, the one on the, the far left, and one in the middle is a bantam. So the bantam one, this blue one, she is about a third the size of the large one. But then we have the Japanese bantam. So the Japanese is what we call a true bantam. There are no big versions of the Japanese. So if you see a bird like this, automatically it's Japanese. What are the characteristics of this one? Really high tail, extremely short back, very short. Um, coupled nature, really short to the ground. Other breeds that we, we would consider true bantams would be the Seabrights, or another true bantam. Um, and think of another one off the top of my head, off the cuff. Um, Dutch. Dutch are another true bantam. There are no larger Dutch out there. So if you, if you see a large version of a Japanese, just know that it's not a pure breed. It's something else okay quickly let's go over um exhibition exhibition versus production so we talked a little bit about this um to me being in the in the industry for a while both the production and the exhibition when i look at a bird i can automatically tell that it is a productive production bird or an exhibition bird okay because there's clear differences especially with these two birds right here to me exhibition birds um, are more refined in their look. The angles are different. Um, how they're built is just different than a productive bird. Again, exhibition birds are built for looking pretty. Production birds are built to produce. Produce eggs, produce meat. That's what they're bred for. Okay? Um, in terms of exhibition and production, exhibition birds are produced in a lower number because you're looking for quality, not quantity in the exhibition world. In production, it's the opposite. I should say, it's kind of both. 
you want a good quality bird that's going to produce a lot, um, but you also want them in larger quantities so you can produce a lot of eggs, a lot of meat from a lot of chickens. Okay. Well, let's go back real quick. So again, look at these two birds here. You can definitely tell that these are two leghorns based on the characteristics we described earlier. But you can definitely tell which one is the production one and which one is the exhibition one. The hint, the top one is the exhibition one and the bottom one is the production one. Okay, Just a little bit more refined in the top one. Plus, she's in a show coup at a show. What do you mean by refined? Refined, yep. So let's take an example of the tail, for instance. So if we look at the tail of the exhibition bird, you see how it's it's high, a little high, but it's it's fanned out. Okay. It just looks, she looks more elegant. Okay. Look at the one on the bottom. Right? She's very angular in her body. Her her back kind of angles down, not as flat. Her tail is really high and what we call pinched. It's really, really narrow. So here's the cool thing about the bird on the bottom though. So if we were in Europe, this bird would look better than the bird above it because the British version and the American version of the standard perfection are different, okay? Um, but in the refinedness, you just got a brighter eye in the top one, that comb lops exactly where it should. Um, the one on the bottom just is a little smaller, just very angular in her body and just has that pinched tail. There's a question. Do people raise bantams for show purposes only or for production as well? Great question. They can do both. However, uh, the bantams are not going to produce as well as your bigger birds do. Yep. So my I have Langshan bantams and they will never produce as many eggs or have the size of the eggs as the big ones. They're just smaller, just don't have that higher productive quality. You can, you can use bantams for eggs if you like the smaller ones, it just takes more for a meal. Um, but I would say most of the bantams are used for show as well as for pets. Yep, good question. All right, here's another example of exhibition versus production. Uh, we have two uh, New Hampshire's here, and you can definitely tell which one might be the more refined, the better built bird than the other ones. The top one, again, just shorter back, doesn't have much of a tail to it, um, just very narrow in body as opposed to the one below it. You know, this New Hampshire is much bigger. If I put both these birds up against each other um, outside, the differences in these in terms of body and style would be totally different. So this is just an example of what a production New Hampshire would probably look like and what an exhibition New Hampshire would look like. Is the color of the top one washed out from the sun or just the way it is? I think it's both, Jackie. I think it's both. Yep. So the, the bad thing about New Hampshire's, and I've raised uh, a few of them in my time, um, the color needs to be just right. We always like to tell people um, there are three reds in New Hampshire's. Okay. So you're, I think you're you're onto something. The, the one on the top is just a little bit washed out. Okay. It doesn't have those three distinct reds that we need to see. Um, and it could just be the breeding too. Actually, I think it's more the breeding than being in the sun washed out. Yep. Another question I just thought of, another answer to a question that people ask me all the time. Can you get an exhibition bird out of a production bird? I think through many, 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 many years of breeding uh, and record keeping, that can happen, but it's going to take you a long time to get there. I do know that some guys have put some production leghorn, for instance, into exhibition leghorns to kind of get that productivity back. It's nice to have a nice, cool, crisp looking bird, but if they don't lay eggs, you're not going to get any cool, crisp looking birds the next time. So we have to put some production qualities back in. Just a comment from Joe Walter in Florida. Show birds are bred for type, whereas production birds are bred for either egg or meat production. Absolutely. They got to look good. Got to look good. 
Now, when choosing breeds and looking at the different varieties, some handle our climates better than others. So um, I can't remember his name already, or lost for that Florida guy, might raise certain breeds down there that would do fine down in, Cal or in Florida, but wouldn't do so hot up here in Nebraska where our winters this last winter was negative 20 degrees, right? So depending on where you live can dictate what type of chickens you raise, what varieties or breeds you raise, okay? So we describe these breeds as soft feather or hard feathered breeds. Hard feathered breeds um, do not have that insulative feather quality that a lot of our soft feathered breeds do. Um, their feathers are very tight against the skin, so you don't get that air in between that helps insulate the birds. Um, so thus, uh, hard feather breeds would not do very well up here in our Nebraska winters, um, unless I keep them inside under relative decent temperature. I mean, we're not talking like 70 degrees. We're talking maybe above freezing, uh, 50s, 60s, they do just fine. Um, but the moral of that story is you need to take more precautions with those type of breeds. Now, the soft feather breeds can typically withstand the temperature extremes because of that insulated feather. They have more fluff to them. They have a little space, a little air space in between the feathers. So they don't require as much supplemental heating um, than the hard feather breeds. However, we still don't want them exposed to negative 20 degrees, for instance, for a long time. Um, it does stress them out. But again, the moral of the story is the soft feather breeds, which quite frankly are most of our breeds that we have today, um, will do just fine in some of our winters, as well as the heat too. Here's some examples of some hard feathered breeds. Now, these three breeds, I know um, the guys here in Nebraska, Canada, Minnesota, North Dakota, they raise these breeds. However, they are raised under different conditions. So the modern game bantam, very tight feathered breed, the seal, another one, and then the Cornish. So if you recognize the Cornish, you might recognize it, you know, when you put it in the, on the grill or in the crock pot or whatever, this is where our modern broiler was developed from. from. Nice meaty bird, fast growth, hard feather. Wouldn't do very well out in my barn um, here in Nebraska. As opposed to some of our soft feathered breeds, um, a good, good examples of these are Delawares, um, Chanticleers. Chanticleers actually is one of the more hardier breeds because it was developed in Canada. So it's been bred to withstand those, um, those really negative degree winters up there. And then I had to put a Langshan in there because this is the breed I raise. Great, uh, tolerable of a lot of heat and cold, but again, a soft feathered breed. They can withstand that temperature extreme. There's a question, how does humidity affect soft or hard feathered breeds? Great question. So the humidity can, can be withstood by some of the soft feathered breeds, again, just a little bit better. Uh, well, let me, let me back up, let me back up. I'm gonna reverse that because the humidity increases kind of our, our temperature, right? So our hard feathered breeds like the, the moderns and like the Cornish can withstand a little bit higher humidity and temperature difference in terms of the heat department than some of our soft feathered breeds. High humidity, regardless of where you live, is, is can be a stressor, right? But those hard feathered breeds can handle it just a little bit better. Because you know, some of those insulated feathers and in soft feathered breeds can actually trap heat too. So if it gets too humid, then they have some problems. I'm um, trying to get rid of some of that that uh, that increase in temperature. So you'll see chickens pant a lot. Um, that's when you kind of know they're heat stressed if they're panting, right? So down in Florida, I bet you the seals, the moderns, and the corners would do just fine. And I know guys down there that raise them um, and do just fine under, underneath that high humidity. All right, let's put these comb types up close and personal and look at a few of these. So um, comb type can also dictate which breeds you raise in which climate as well. So here are some short, I'll call them shorter comb types. So the strawberry, walnut, and rose, these are great for the cold because you don't have a whole lot of exposed skin and the combs are tight against the body. Okay. 
So if we're looking at um, the breeds here, we have the, the seal as a strawberry comb. The walnut comb, again, is the is a tall tail sign that we have a silky as well as the silky feathers. And then the rose comb and some of our rose comb breeds, the wine dots, the rose comb itself, um, and some of our rose comb rod reds or uh, lake horns. Okay? So if you live in a really cold climate, thinking about the lake horn breed, you might want to have a rose comb lake horn as opposed to a single comb one. Okay? Because these combs are the ones that are more exposed to the environment. They're farther away from the head. And it's really hard to, to kind of get these uh, or keep these from being frostbitten. There's a couple of things you can do to keep them from being frostbitten, but um, just know that uh, if they're more exposed to the air, they can't get them underneath their wing or they're not tight against the head, that's when we start to get some frostbite issues. Okay. So again, single V-shaped and buttercup are just examples of ones that are just a little more susceptible. So I'm going to leave you with a few uh, final thoughts here. So I've, I've said it a couple of times here. Uh, it takes years to learn these breeds and varieties and strains. Okay? I've only scratched the surface on a couple of these breeds. And I actually use some, some of the more common breeds, but there's so many more breeds and varieties out there. So please attend the show if you can. And I think all the states that Jackie mentioned that are here, um, you, guys, you guys have shows in every one of your states. Um, talk to breeders, check them out, um, uh, learn their varieties, check out hatchery catalogs. That's the easiest way. To be quite frank, that's how I really got started in learning a lot of these breeds is by just looking at hatchery catalogs. Um, because all these breeds have so many unique features, colors, varieties, body types. It just takes a whole lot of time. And, you know, it's quite frankly, really fun to kind of learn all these breeds, um, and to talk to people about them. So again, I've scratched the surface. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, um, please reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk chickens. Um, I know Jackie's pretty well versed in a lot of these breeds as well. Um, and she, uh, there's some good shows down there in Kentucky. So um, have any questions whatsoever, please reach out to either myself or, or Jackie and we'll be able to help you in any way we can. So. We have one question. Some of my 4-Hers bought blue laced red wine dots. Yes. But they have single combs, not rose combs. Ooh. Are there any breeds with that color pattern and a single comb? Yeah. So I'm going to. So great question. So if I if I'm judging a bird and I found that my automatic go to breed is going to be a Plymouth Rock. Because both the, both the wine dots and the Plymouth Rock are fairly similar, especially those from the hatchery are fairly similar looking. But if I went to a show with a single comb, uh, white lace red uh, uh, wine dot, my gosh, I couldn't get the word out. Um, that's actually disqualification. So they cannot come in a single comb. So I would say just lump them into the Plymouth Rock category. Okay. Uh, anyone have any other questions? You got a thank you for sharing. Okay. Thanks for having me. I'm going to try to stop sharing here. There we go. Oh, there were some examples of um, true bantams from Pam in Washington State. Cerama. Yep. Ceramas. Yep. Yep. Uh, do you? The uncles. I don't know the how uncles. you say that. Yeah, I've heard a couple of ways. I say the uncles. Some say the uncles. So, yep. So, Pam knows a lot too. Are there any large birds with no bantams? Ooh, that's a great question. Are there large breeds with no bantams? Let me quick run in my head. There probably uh, are. There. Uh, <laughs> can't think of one i don't think so i think every large breed has a band has a bantam associated with it warpingtons I'm, yep Warpingtons. they do yeah trying to run through them really quick in my head um silkies don't have bantams i mean don't have yep, they're true 
Yep, they're true bantams. They don't have a larger counterpart. No, I'm pretty sure every breed has a bantam associated with it. Yeah, I can't think of one. No. Yep. Uh, Joe, again, from Florida, says large comb can be problematic in areas with high mosquito population. Ah, absolutely. You're right. You're absolutely right. And I just saw Megan. I know Megan. I just saw it come up in the chat. I think yeah. she's right. I don't think there's a Bantam Crevacour. Megan, <laughs> you, you got me. You got me, Megan. <laughs> uh, Bresse. That's okay. a blue leg chicken, right? Is that yeah, a... Yeah. That's so a that's standard, a, right? It is. You're right. Blue laced reds are not in the SOP. They are not. Hopefully they will be. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of them come around and they're starting to get better and better and better. I so. was gonna look at I have the, the new standard. You have the new one? Oh good. I need to get one. I'm becoming a judge, so I probably should get a new uh a new standard. Fine dots are are what class? American. That's what I thought. Yeah, I've seen some really nice blue lace red wine dots, large fowl lately, in the shows that I've kind of judged and went to. And um, trying to get APA certified. Yep. That takes years, guys. <laughs> that takes years. A lot of studying. I'm looking for the wine dots. See what else we got. Oh, Megan. I don't, you know, I don't think there's a bantam crevicoy. That's possibly yeah. there may be bantams in other countries for those breeds that we mm -hmm. only have standards. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep. And so, Amy Wynad says there is no bantam crevicoy. Yeah. So Wynad. you're right, Jackie. There, in the British standard, they may have bantam versions of some of these that we don't, or vice versa. So I need to get a hold of a bantam or a um British standard. Yeah, there's an Australian standard too. Yep. Yep. No, there is no what was it? Red. Uh red blue laced. There's a blue, but there's no blue laced. Yep. Fine dots. Uh, it hasn't been recognized yet. But I bet it will be. I'm starting to see them all over the place. It's only a matter of time. Yeah, they just have to get it so that it's standardized. It breeds true. Yep. Or if we don't have it, you can create it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a lot of work, Pam. Yeah. Oh. I'm working on bringing back Bantam Javas in oh, black okay. and mottled. Yep. 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 That's a breed I don't see very often anymore is the Javas. So we need to be working on these breeds that we don't see very often. She's on year nine. Wow, she's committed. Uh, and Joe says there are varieties in the American Bantam standard exactly. protection that are not in the APA. Yep. Yeah, the Bantam guys have their own standard. Yep, they do. I need a new version of that too. I got the 98 version. <laughs> I don't even I'm think way I behind the times. I have an old British one, but. Yep. Okay, guys, that's. Do the exhibitors at the shows have to be inspected or checked in any way to prove they are raising and transporting the chickens in a humane manner? Not really. No, nope. I would say most, vast majority of people are transporting them in a safe manner because they love uh, their chickens. They love their chickens, and they if they're going to a show, they got to make make sure they look good. Mm. So I know with me, I know Megan on there, we transport our birds in um, show boxes, wooden show boxes. So each bird has its own slot. So it can't be beat up by another one. It can't be pooped on. And so got to keep them clean. Got to keep them nice. Perhaps you want to get them good with, look, want them to look good when we get to shows. Yep. Some show do have rules as to transport. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. I know that they inspect the birds coming in in most cases especially big poultry shows and yep. um blood test for pylorum yep and 
lately they have been randomly testing for avian influenza. I know to bring birds in Nebraska, you have to form test, and then you have to, in some cases, have a certificate of veterinary inspection. The vet has to look at them. Um, and then typically you have to have an import number. So those and, are kinds of little regs. And Jocelyn asked, what impact has HPAI have on shows? And I would imagine getting a certificate for avian influenza to cross state lines would be a pain. Yep. Yeah, some shows are requiring that, um, especially in those states. I believe Minnesota might be one because of the high turkey populations up there. Well, so. we, you can't bring any birds in across the state line into to Kentucky unless they have a certificate okay. to say that they are from an avian influenza free flock. Okay. But, you know, try getting a veterinarian to do it. <laughs> Knowing anything about chickens. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, Pam says, yeah, there were lots of canceled shows. Yeah. Yeah, that one year, what was it? Was it 2021? I can't remember which year that was. It started in it was... 22 is when it got really 22? bad. Yeah, that was kind of a bad year for us show guys. Everything got shut down. and Yeah. So, yeah. yeah we... And then, of course, the COVID year before that. When oh, we, that's right. We, <laughs> that we could... The... 2020 was the COVID year and we couldn't uh, do anything with the kids. I went to a show in Arkansas and uh, we had to wear masks the entire time at the show. So oh, that was that was tough being in a barn full of birds and you have to wear a mask. Yeah. Oh, oh well. <laughs> okay, so we're finished a little early. And as I said, this is, was recorded. It will be up on our YouTube channel uh, later tonight, probably, or early tomorrow. Um, and next month, we are talking about the life of a small backyard poultry owner. What does it, what does it take to have a small backyard flock? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for coming. and hope to see you all next week. Thanks, Brett. Great job. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. You too.